facing probably the largest environmental threat ever, and that's global warming. And global warming will affect every aspect of life as we know it. It will affect species diversity, it will affect water, it will affect the urban and the rural communities. Global warming and the pollution and the burning of fossil fuel that caused it are threats that we see here in California and everywhere around the world. We have no choice but to meet this challenge. Global oil production is likely to peak within the next two to five years. Natural gas production in North America has already peaked, so it's not a situation where we have 20 or 30 or 50 years of lead time where we can develop a robust hydrogen economy, for example, as many people have suggested. No, we actually need solutions uh, very, very soon. It is essential for government to play a role uh, in, in solving this crisis. And I want to describe the two mechanisms uh, that I've developed, which are now law. Community choice laws give cities and counties the right to bundle, or aggregate, their residential, business, and governmental electric power needs into group buying contracts and put them out on bid to energy suppliers. These group contracts marshal enough collective financial clout to demand from suppliers the largest mix of renewable energy sources at the lowest prices possible in their region. I am a fan of community choice aggregation, which means communities get to decide their own power sources. Because essentially that means that whole communities will be able to buy their own power and theoretically could buy greener, cleaner power. And then the utilities would deliver that power to them. So far, there are community choice laws in five states. Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Jersey, Ohio, California, and soon, Illinois. Local Power wrote California's community choice law, AB 117, and then State Assemblywoman Carol Migdon sponsored it. In 2002, state lawmakers passed it, and former Governor Gray Davis signed it. You aggregate all of your uh, electrical bill payers whether they're residential, commercial, or city governments. You pull them all together and then you can decide your own timetable on how much you're going to shift to renewability. The state of California right now is mandating that we get to 20% of our electrical supply statewide being renewably generated by the year 2017. Uh, communities who choose to aggregate their own electricity can easily say, no, I want to get to 40% renewability by the year 2017. Well, what I say to that is go 10% further. Go to 50% and then you're halfway there, right? 50% uh, of our electricity renewably by the year 2017, uh, that's exciting, you know. That's not just a band-aid on a problem. That's the beginnings of a major shift, you know, that paradigm shift to a different energy system. The County of Marin, all 250,000 residents and businesses could decide where we get our energy from. So PG&E would still transmit the energy, but we would get to decide where we're buying it from, how much, and what the cost is. In the past, it's always been we're at the whim of the utilities and the Public Utility Commission about where we get our energy from. But now, through community choice aggregation, we can really have a lot more say-so around our energy future. The bill was written to include energy efficiency as well as renewable energy. What you need to realize about energy efficiency is it's the cheapest resource. It's much cheaper than coal-fired power plants. Every strategy that we discuss here at the county starts with efficiency programs first. The big win, frankly, is becoming much more electricity efficient and effective with the way we generate, distribute, and consume electricity. For every dollar you spend on energy efficiency, it cycles through the economy four times. If you spend a dollar on energy from utility, it's guaranteed to leave the economy very quickly, maybe almost immediately. So by creating a locally produced and locally generated energy efficiency program and really taking control of our own energy future, we would create an upteen number of job opportunities. Our community development agency here at the County of Marin has calculated that on our own commercial rooftops, we could generate half the electricity we need today if we covered them with solar panels. You wouldn't want to just rely on one energy source like that, but it's an achievable target. Certainly, aggregating our purchasing power 
will go a long way down the road to saving a lot of money. And it's all about saving money and helping the environment. The good news is, is there could be long-term and future savings out there at a time when the rest of the country is paying more and more for fossil fuel. And they don't even incorporate the social costs driven by climate change or the cost of our military to go get that fossil fuel. So at a time of increasing terrorism and lack of security, a little local distributed energy grid of solar panels on someone's roof or on the top of a Safeway store or a little windmill here and there, methane digesters, frankly is a lot more secure from a homeland security standpoint than our monolithic centralized utility structure. Aggregation works, and the San Francisco Bay Area is not the only region in California seeking to implement community choice. In 1990, as Culver City Mayor, businessman Albert Vera founded the Southern California Cities Joint Power Consortium to aggregate the power needs of 12 cities. As the consortium's executive director, Vera has worked with local power since 1996 to help pass the state's community choice law. Now, as a city council member, he's preparing to implement a community choice ordinance for Culver City. Thank you very much. Have a good day now. Thank you. I used to give this example. Certified grocers, they started with two or three members. When they got 20 members, the case of beans came down to $18. The more uh, uh, customers or, uh, or members they got, the cheaper the merchandise. Why? Because they bought in large quantity and they saved money. So that was the idea behind that we together can save money for the people. That was the original idea. And with that I went in front of uh, many cities, Carson, Culver City, El Segundo, Gardena, Hawthorne, Inglewood, Lawndale, Lomita, Redondo Beach, and West Hollywood. And the county came in, not as a member, but as a supporter. So whatever we do, the county is right there to support us. So the idea of the consortium, the idea of aggregating, is, I think it's excellent. In community choice aggregation, uh, the concept is um, in AB 117 actually created the opportunity for local governments, cities and counties to work on behalf of their ratepayers as aggregators for the commodity portion. It leaves the relationship between the ratepayer the local citizen ratepayer and their local investor-owned utilities and the, with PUC regulation in place, they keep the pipes and wires that deliver you know, gas and electricity in their community. The relationship is exactly the same. That should protect them you know, 99%, if not 100%, from the reliability issue. The implementation of environmental initiatives and policies really has to begin at the local level and that it really has to transcend up to the international level, but it has to begin at the local level. So we started with education, um, then we started passing the legislation, uh, and, and now we're implementing the legislation, looking to implement it through the Public Utilities Commission, which is making decisions every day, not only about community choice, but other laws that can create more green power in, in California, and certainly about those corporations, those electrical monopolies that have gotten us into this mess in the first place who are continually bailed out by the state, putting ratepayers on the hook for their mistakes. And those kinds of decisions are happening every day at the Public Utilities Commission. And so local power is playing a very important role, protecting the ratepayers and the consumers in this instance and the environment to make sure that the kinds of regulations uh, that we need in order to stop global warming and, and assure uh, fair rates go through, and also to make sure that there is a level of corporate responsibility by PG&E and San Diego Gas and Electric and Southern Edison so that they can no longer be bailed out by the state and then uh, you know, move their um, assets to other states, buy power generation in other states, and continue to be one of the wealthiest multinational corporations in the world and yet still seem to be bankrupt here in California. The problem is if we as a commission continue to stall the implementation of our statutory mandate and in addition allow the utilities or order the utilities to overbuy natural gas and electricity from, from fossil sources, the communities will never be able to get to a clean renewable future because we'll already have bought the electricity for them for the next 10 years. So there's been this push-pull of the utilities moving fast ahead on multi-year plans to buy electricity as if there is no community aggregation and the commission delaying the implementation of the law that would allow communities to get out from under 
this fossil fuel future. And that truly is, I believe, uh, an intentional uh, abrogation of our duty to enforce the law. This is a great opportunity to just put the pedal to the metal on renewables instead of investing in a whole new supply chain to the Middle East or to you know, Indonesia or East Timor or any number of, of less than ideal business partners. So we've essentially taken the ratepayers checkbook and written a blank check to liquefied natural gas suppliers and said, please give us all this natural gas. Well, if it turns out that I'm right, and we're going to, in fact, change out our natural gas plant fleet, we'll have bought way too much natural gas than what we need to make electricity. And who will pay for that? California businesses and families. So we are at the cusp of a decision here, and I hope that, frankly, Californians put pressure on the governor and the legislature to put pressure on the Public Utilities Commission members to reverse that decision. All of us have sent letters to the PUC notifying them that you should not get hooked into any long-term contracts that result in higher exit fees for us because we have put you on notice that we intend to aggregate and leave. And PG&E is already hedging on longer-term contracts to deal with the fact that Fresno, San Francisco, Marin County, Emeryville, Oakland, and all these jurisdictions are in the process of formalizing their business plans for aggregation. We've been looking under every rock that we could find to, you know, unearth the hidden boogeyman, and so far we haven't found one. There is not risk to the general fund. There is not excessive legal or liability risk to any of the city or county governments that would engage in this. There's no loss of local efficiency investment opportunity or local credits for solar or net metering benefits or any of those things that we would otherwise enjoy staying in the status quo. Thank you very much. It's a great day. It's a great day for green power. It's a great day for lower rates. It's a great day to end blackouts. It's a great day to remove the profit motive from something that is the right of all of us, and that is to have heat and light and warmth. Why shouldn't we, every, every single municipality in their 58 counties in this mighty state, have an opportunity to create their own clean energy portfolio? Experts say that it will take massive investment to move the economy away from fossil fuels. With the federal government failing to deliver a green Apollo program that is needed, it falls upon local government to do it. And San Francisco is poised to take the leadership position. They have carefully crafted a piece of legislation that will deliver 360 megawatts of renewable energy and conservation. That's half of what the city uses. With community choice, San Francisco is indeed walking the walk. Compare this to PG&E, which has been doing a lot of talking lately, but little walking. PG&E wants ratepayers to fund eight new fossil fuel plants. They also plan for increased reliance on nuclear power, which PG&E is now calling clean energy. PG&E CEO Peter Darby is saying that environmentalists now support nuclear power. Well, let me say, on behalf of the Sierra Club's 750,000 members, that environmentalists do not support nuclear power. The Sierra Club is anti-nuclear, period. Nuclear power is costly and risky, creating targets for terrorists and producing deadly waste that we don't know what to do with. Global warming is also costly and risky. PG&E's ad campaigns won't market us out of climate change. It's time for San Francisco to take action. To make it happen, we need the San Francisco PUC to jump on board 100%. As Al Gore said of global warming, I don't really consider this a political issue. I consider it to be a moral issue. Thank you. How does it feel? It feels incredibly gratifying, and it's a huge relief. I mean, the main concern with, with uh, legislation is there's this tendency in this day and age to water it down before you file it, sort of the pre-compromised attitude of a lot of politicians. And fortunately, Tom Amiano is not of that variety, and he held out under a lot of pressure to, to do so. 
So we have legislation going forward that's 100% sharp and to the point, and uh, you know we're ready now to go in and, and deal with the, the committee process and answer the opposition. And then there's the matter of, of PG&E's behavior. Uh, you know, they've had the Green the City campaign. They spent $17 million, not on solar panels, but on advertisements claiming to be green. On the subsidy front, the federal government spends about $25 billion a year subsidizing coal and oil. In the industrial world overall, that figure is $200 billion. We're saying take that money away from coal and oil, put it behind renewables. The oil companies will follow the money, and they will become aggressive developers of fuel cells and solar panels and windmills. I think a properly structured energy transition holds the potential for an unprecedented worldwide economic boom. A global public works program to rewire the planet would create millions and millions of jobs all over the world. It would begin to reverse the widening gap between the North and South. It would allow developing economies to grow without regard to atmospheric limits and without the budgetary burden of imported oil. And I think in a very short time, you would see renewable energy eclipse high technology as the central driving engine of growth of the global economy. California has the potential, once again, to be the leader in something that's new and exciting and innovative, um, which is the green economy. That's the next economy. That's the new century's economy. The UN decided in its wisdom to convene the world mayors here in the city and county of San Francisco under the theme of green cities. The reality is in cities we consume some 75 percent of the world's natural resources. And a consequence, and by extension, we pollute disproportionately the world as it relates to the consumption of those resources. But the good news is, as mayors from around the world know all too well, and the former mayors know, you can do an extraordinary amount without waiting around for someone else to solve the problem at the local level. Community choice is an example of how important it is for local action, that the broader regional and national change and international change is going to start at the local level. And it's going to start with local governments taking advantage of options they have, like community choice aggregation.